I hope you can, let me just check that you can actually see me. Uh, you should be able to see me, yeah. Um, so my name is uh, Micah Preuss. Um, and I'm actually, uh, I've recently moved or relocated. So I'm, I'm now uh, based at uh, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, but I also have still an affiliation with the University of Manchester in, in the UK. So it's my pleasure to take you through the morning session of the second day of the uh, ILL ESS uh, user meeting. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Lambert van Eyck, who's going to give the first talk this morning. So Lambert, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for that. Um, let me turn you over to the... Do you see now my presentation? Michael, can you confirm that you see the screen? I, I see a screen, I can confirm. Okay, so um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to uh, present our uh, work, which we uh, titled Where Neutron Scientists Are and What They Do. Um, the uh, project uh, and this presentation actually is in the scope uh, of a bigger project, uh, the Brightness Project uh, 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 from the uh, ESS and uh, many uh, partners. Um, I'm the vice chair of ENSA and Henrik Reno is the uh, chair of ENSA. Uh, ENSA doesn't have a, a single office like uh, most facilities or universities and the ENSA delegates are spread over Europe. So uh, we decided to uh, uh, do our ENSA uh, 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 work packages of the brightness project to uh, to actually do most of it in um, at the TU Delft because uh, Evgeny and uh, me are based in, at the TU Delft, so also part of uh, Enza and we're part of uh, brightness. Um, the goal of our brightness uh, project is to identify what are the user community needs for the future. And uh, because of that, we started off uh, to identify our community using artificial intelligence and natural language processing. And this is the part where, where I'm going to give a presentation on. Uh, so this is ongoing work, but we already have some first results. Um, so the uh, central person in this, uh, uh, in this whole uh, endeavor to use uh, artificial intelligence is Evgeny Velichko, which you see here on the left uh, side. He's our data scientist uh, from the TU Delft. And uh, he actually did uh, uh, all of the programming and, uh, and uh, nearly everything of the graphics. And then at this stage, uh, while I'm talking, we're also uh, sending out uh, surveys to our uh, Newton uh, community. So, so all this work is done in, uh, in Delft, but uh, it involves many, many people. So here on the right side, you see a uh, snapshot of all the uh, national delegates. So they're all involved in this, uh, in this project. And, the, and basically what we uh, program in Delft, uh, our analysis, this then goes to these delegates uh, and the delegates then uh, communicate this with their community. And uh, with the final aim to get the opinion of the community about where should we go in uh, for neutron science in the future. So just to put a bit of uh, a context to the uh, work that we're going to uh, present here, uh, everything we wrote is in um, is from Python, uh, Python uh, uh, scripting. So all the natural language processing that we're going to be talking about is done with uh, existing uh, packages, uh, NLTK and GenSim, uh, and we've been using uh, the so-called latent uh, Dirichlet allocation algorithm to uh, analyze published work. And I should say that uh, the, the work that I'm going to show here is based on uh, metadata of uh, publications, so abstracts and, uh, and other information from the Scopus uh, database. So that also sets the uh, uh, a bit the, the, the scheme and the limitations. We, we don't claim to have covered all uh, publications uh, of neutron science, but it, it is a considerable fraction and I do think it's representative. Um, so just to show the concept of 
natural language processing NLP. This is what they call uh, uh, artificial intelligence. It's basically you take uh, the publications of all uh, neutral science that is done in the world or in Europe, and then you try to uh, uh, group these publications in a certain number of topics. And I think it's very similar to mo what most people uh, know from uh, 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 review panels uh, at the facilities, for instance, or at uh, scientific uh, councils. Uh, the, the number of topics uh, could be sort of seen as uh, something similar to the number of um, uh, panels, uh, uh, science panels or review panels or colleges uh, at the ILL. Um, so a publication to the computer is a string of words. We take out uh, all the figures. We take out the so-called stopping words or stop words, the, the non-relative, uh, non-relevant -re words. And then you try to, uh, to orient, uh, uh, or you try to see a publication as a string of words and as, as such it is, becomes a vector and you can imagine that its vector is in a multi 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 dimensional space because there are so many words and different words in different uh, publications and then you eventually try to group publications together you could visualize this as we did here on the left side saying that for instance this is a method here the fraction this is the method axis you could have a scientific axis where you would call things magnetism for instance and then in social relevance, you could say, well, there's another axis uh, and magnetism uh, might fall on the computing if, if computing would be a word that you use for social relevance. Um, the analysis that we've done is, is, uh, is multidimensional. So it's, uh, you can imagine the amount of words that are used in publications over the last uh, many decades. And then we try to simplify uh, visualizing how these publications are grouped so in this case here on the right hand side, you see a visualization uh, uh, technique that actually projects everything of the multi-dimensional space onto two dimensions. And immediately you should recognize that here what's called PC1 and PC2 are principal components. You could read them as axes, but basically they don't have a real physical meaning. So there are also no tick marks. So we'll be explaining about how this visualization tool helps us to identify uh, the uh, grouping of uh, as, a, as a computer does. And we started off doing that uh, with two very famous uh, neutron scatterers, um, Nobel Prize uh, winners uh, Brockhaus and Schull. And this is sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, the link to our title because uh, in the introduction uh, to their uh, uh, Nobel Prize award, it was summarized at some point uh, uh, saying that Shaw actually tells you where the uh, atoms are uh, by doing diffraction and Brockhaus actually tells you what the atoms are doing by looking at the uh, uh, spectroscopy. So this simplified picture that we're going now to actually apply that to these two scientists. So where are these two scientists? Well, they're based here at uh, MIT and at uh, McMaster's. So that's a very simple thing to do, but of course, this is only at one certain time, so we're not, not their whole lives here. Um, then you can do a network analysis on their uh, publication. So you, you can look at with whom did they collaborate. So the first thing that is transpires from this network diagram, uh, we've placed these pictures of uh, Scholl and Brockhaus on top of it, of course, is that uh, the computer actually sees that uh, there are two separate networks when you feed it these publications because the, uh, the people that uh, Brockhaus has collaborated with was a very distinct group of people from uh, Scholl. Um, and uh, this network diagram, well, you could read this as them being the spider in the web, in the center of the web. There are some things which, uh, uh, which then you also see appearing that sometimes there is, for instance, here, in very light yellow, a second spider, it seems to be in the web. So that seems to be also a central person. Uh, the um, sizes of these circles uh, refer to the number of publications and the thickness of the lines. If you can see that on your screen, then the thickness of the lines actually represents how uh, many uh, co uh, publications are in common. So what you see immediately is that both people actually work together with a lot of 
different uh, countries already then. And I think it's evident that this has become much more uh, expanded even uh, today. So this network, you can also project that on the uh, world map. So here we see a bit uh, of America and uh, Canada. And then for instance, this uh, you see a Brockhaus and Scholl. And then you see, for instance, there's this second spider in the web, uh, which is then uh, at uh, Chalk, uh, Chalk River. A lot of experiments were done. So this is a way to visualize um, um, basically who, when, and where. But in this case, we've left out the when component. But you could imagine having a scroll bar through time. And then you see how these networks grow and also uh, possibly shrink if someone changes uh, topics. Um, then the next thing to do is to actually to uh, uh, to identify what are they doing. So not uh, when and where, but what are they doing? Um, and for that, we feed the computer, the NLP uh, algorithm, National Language Processing Algorithm, with all the publications of Brockhaus and Scholl. Computer does not know uh, which is Brockhaus and which is uh, Scholl. And uh, if you feed it, then uh, um, it comes up with, uh, uh, well, basically, we've asked it to separate the whole corpus into two uh, separate uh, topics. And basically, what you see here on the on the right hand side is that our, uh, it places two topics in this map, uh, which are separated. Uh, there's no overlap between those two uh, circles uh, here. And this circle uh, on the right hand side, circle one, consists of these words: the fraction, Newton diffraction, polarization, magnetic, magnetic scattering, beam, etc., etc., etc. If you then switch to the topic number two. Then you see the first word that it appears is dispersion, vibrations, lattice vibrations, modes. So already, I think from this case, everybody could guess who is who. If I tell you that uh, Scholl did a lot of uh, work on where atoms are and uh, Brockhaus did a lot of work on uh, um, uh, what atoms uh, do. So this is a sort of a simplified case where it's easy to identify actually or to justify what a um, uh, no, I should use the word explain what the computer has done. So this, this is, I think, something everybody can grasp based on this uh, uh, model. Uh, if you then take the whole set of publications from Europe, then it becomes more difficult because now a topic is not a single scientist anymore, but there, there can be many scientists. So these topics on the left hand side, this is what I'll try to explain a bit how we uh, come uh, and how we name them. So we cannot name them Brockhaus and Scholl anymore. This maybe alludes a bit to a, a toy, which I think most people will recognize here on the right hand side, uh, where uh, your, your, your child is, uh, when it's very young, tries to squeeze through a circular um, object through a triangular square. And this is basically where you will be teaching your uh, child, possibly the words triangle, star, and um, circle. So tagging these, uh, naming these uh, objects here actually requires human uh, intelligence. And that's also you, uh, what we will ask the scientists to do. So the computer has no idea what it has done. It has separated things, but it doesn't know how to name them. Um, I've blown up um, one of the figures. I hope you can uh, see it because the, uh, there's so many words in here. Um, uh, as I explained, uh, there uh, the whole multidimensional space of all the words, all the vocabulary of all the publications over the last decades of European Newton scattering is now we've asked it to separate the computer to separate it into seven topics, and uh, in this two-dimensional representation of distances between the different topics, uh, the, so that's a projection of a multidimensional distance onto uh, two-dimensional axis. It has actually placed topic number one quite far away from the other topics. And these other topics seems to be, according to the computer, more related. The size of the circle that you see is actually uh, the size of the topic in the whole corpus of publications. So you could say that topic one is the biggest topic. Um, on the right hand side, you, you see what we call terms or what are called terms in this uh, uh, scope. So terms are words which are abbreviated. So we take out 
if if it's uh, uh, magnetic or uh, if it's a structure or structures, then structures and structure will be considered as one word. So it, there's some filtering in these words. Uh, and then on the right hand side or on the right top side, you see also a relevance metric. And I'll try to explain a bit what relevance metric uh, is by giving you some examples. Um, if I change this relevance metric here on the top, the slide bar to the left completely, then um, I get only the words which are relevant to topic one. So topic one now here on the left side gets this list of words and I just wanted to zoom in to make it a bit more visual. You see that it contains the words magnetic structure, magnetic properties, magnetic ordering, et cetera, et cetera. So there's something like 30 terms here shown, which computer says these are really very unique to topic number one. So one of the things which uh, is interesting is that there are many words, uh, magnetic, magnetic, except for the uh, mu bore, uh, but the word magnetic itself is not in there. Um, so what Evgeny and me have uh, done is that we've named these seven topics, as you see here on the top side, we call the first one magnetism, despite the fact that the word magnetic is not in this uh, list of uh, topics or it's not in the top list. Then we create a second uh, term instrumentation, fundamental uh, protein dynamics number four, surfaces and interfaces, soft matter and biomembranes. And this naming is actually done by, by us as suggested by us to the user community. And since the user community or a part of the user community is probably listening uh, uh, at this uh, user meeting, we actually thought we should uh, explain a bit about what, what is happening uh, here. And the reason, for instance, why the word magnetic is not uh, in there is uh, easily seen if you scroll the uh, slide bar of relevance metric all the way to one, then basically you, if you click on topic one, you see another list of words. And now you do see that the word magnetic actually appears on top. So in this relevance metric, the word magnetic is very important, but you see from the colors of these bars that the red part is only, the red part is only uh, the a frequency, which is, uh, or it's part of the whole frequency or the collection of words that it found in the whole corpus. So if you click then on this word magnetic, actually the computer can tell you well, I found the word magnetic in topic one, so it's a very important topic, but relatively there are also uh, in other topics that you find the word magnetic. And this is why it actually says the word magnetic is not unique to topic one. So we've been doing this uh, exercise of finding uh, name tags that humans or scientists would recognize, and we came up with these, for seven topics, we came up with a list with, of these topics, and basically we now we are now at the stage where we are going to, uh, ask, where we ask our national delegates whether they agree with this uh, naming. And in parallel, for the purpose of the brightness project, we've also uh, created a survey. And for this survey, we can uh, generate all kinds of distributions from uh, our analysis. So you can make a distribution, for instance, of all the magnetism work done in Europe on this uh, left side map. You can uh, see how it distributes, the science distributes over time. So you see, you see here on the right side that the number of publications have, has grown uh, uh, enormously over the last uh, decades. And uh, for instance, you see that uh, instrumentation has become a much uh, bigger part in the recent years. And magnetism, for instance, actually has shrunken in a relatively, uh, or actually in absolute way uh, also. Um, the same kind of distribution of topics for the whole of Europe. Uh, so this is all, uh, this is collectively uh, over all of the time uh, in the last uh, graph. You can also do that per country. So so now you have defined the topics. You can look at how topics are distributed uh, for different uh, countries. And then, for instance, for Sweden, you see uh, that uh, well, I think due to the ESS, there uh, is uh, already a considerable increase in the number of publications and especially here in uh, instrumentation so you can uh, you can predict from this kind of graph that publications in sweden will uh, will start to explode as soon as the first neutrons uh, have arrived um, so this thing is now out to all our delegates so we've created these pie charts and also the 
timelines of publications uh, for the different ENSA countries, and we've given uh, those uh, to the uh, national delegates. And we've also created surveys. So the surveys are also out to our user community and with a special request to you if you are the user community of the uh, ENSA delegates to help and fill out your uh, user needs. So this is you uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe. This is how you are distributed over Europe. This is, of course, biased by population density. So mind that uh, uh, when you look at these kind of graphs. And basically what we are looking at, uh, where what we want to know from you as user community is what would you need for the future? So this is why uh, hereby we have an extra request to you, use the occasion to ask you to fill in the survey if you've uh, not already uh, done so. In the parallel, we've been collecting um, uh, statistics as well, because that's in the same corpus of uh, publications. So you see, for instance, the number of pub Newton publications has uh, risen uh, considerably, and Europe is uh, uh, actually taking a, 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 a large fraction of that uh, number of publications. So we're doing uh, quite well. On the right hand side, you see the uh, average numbers of uh, number of co authors publications. So you see also that rises. So I should have put in here actually the legend. So the blue one is European, and this is the other uh, country. So uh, uh, not European. And then you see that the number of publications over uh, the last decades has actually increased uh, enormously. I think it's an indication of how complex science has uh, become and material science. You, need many more people to tackle a problem. Um, I thank you uh, for, the, uh, for your attention. I also thank uh, the ESS and ILL for giving us the opportunity. I also would like to thank our delegates, uh, which are all involved in this uh, uh, project and spent uh, quite some time communicating with you, the user community. And of course, I thank uh, the Evgeny who's sitting actually next to me here for doing all the real work. And Henrik Reno, who's uh, been very supportive and actually came up also with the idea of using um, these smart algorithms uh, back when we were, I think, having our ENSA meeting in Russia. So uh, that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lambert. Um, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. So we have um, a few questions coming in now. Um, so actually, the first one was uh, from uh, was by Klaus Dieter Liss, uh, related to the uh, spider network. Um, uh, was actually I thought it was looked quite interesting these two heads within the spider network. Uh, uh, I wonder if they would approve of such uh, appearance. Uh, exactly this one. And so the the, the question here by Klaus Dieter uh, was. Um, in the spider network, what means the radius, so the distance? Does that actually have a meaning? No, it does not. It does not have a meaning. It just tries to uh, separate things, and basically, you should think. I, I this network is also something you could visualize in more dimensions, and this is a two-dimensional simplification of it. So m maybe I should not use spiders, but I should use stellar. Uh, uh, constellations instead of uh, spiders. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, then uh, the next question is uh, by Alan Hewitt. Um, in your first plot, the order was magnetism, structure phases, diffraction, but the topics in your pie chart are quite different. Where in your pie chart are structure phases and the fraction. Um, yes, so um, does that refer to this? Because the pie chart, I so let me first explain the pie chart. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the pie chart comes from, we tell the computer, give us seven topics. So this is how you get seven balloons here, or seven circles. And then uh, uh, in one, you see uh, the words magnetic and structure. If you look at, so this is topic one. If you then look topic one and you adjust this scroll bar, or I have to go back now, uh, you adjust this me uh, metric scroll bar to zero, 
you find the words which are really unique to topic one, and then you find magnetic structure and magnetic uh, properties. So you can read them actually on the right hand side. There are more words here. So actually, the word magnetic might it will appear in this list, but maybe it well as you can see, it doesn't appear in the top part of it. Um, and then the interpretation, what is here on the top, is the same interpretation that we used in the pie chart. And these names, so we've named this group magnetism, um, but you might well disagree with this name. So uh, the structure is definitely a part of it. And we decided not to call it mag magnetic structures because there are probably also some words which refer, I should look at it uh, more carefully now, but which do not refer to magnetism or to structure only. So that is why we've decided to call it magnetism, uh, but I agree that it mainly contains structure here in group one. So I hope that answers the question. That's a bit of uh, the nuisance with having this virtual, right? So the dynamic, ma magnetic dynamics uh, are not in any other groups. So that's why you should consider magnetism also to con contain dynamics. Okay. Hmm. There's okay. no possibility to ask Alan a question back, right? Or um, There is actually, um, but um, I've just seen there are two more questions coming in and I think it will take me now a while to find, uh, hang on, no, actually, hang on, there is uh, Alan, there we go. Um, allowed to talk. Alan, you, you are allowed to talk now. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, uh, Lambert. I don't think you did answer my question okay. because you didn't, you didn't show the pie chart. And it looks quite different to the first plot you showed. You have now no mention of uh, structure, phases, and diffraction. Where do they come in that pie chart? Um, so you, you do refer to, to these topics or these no, words, these terms? Pre previous, previous plot. There. Yes. Oh, you have so, magnetic, structure, phase, diffraction. Yes. So the reason why these are these words uh, are important to this group, but they're not only important to this group, they're also important to many other groups. And this is basically, for instance, for the for, for structure, it's quite obvious. It is an important uh, topic, so it has been placed on the word is important in this topic, so it has been placed as the second item. But the word structure, if I would click on it on the interactive version, I would see that it also appears in many other topics. So it's not unique to this topic. And that's why it's not, um, 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 if it's not unique to this topic, then it's not, uh, how do I say that? Um, I, I, the, the topic cannot exclusively claim the word structure. And if I do change, so, so this is with this relevance metric on, uh, 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 set to one. If I then set the relevance metric to zero, then I also see the word structure, for instance. And now magnetic structure is something which is really unique to this topic. Right. And the word magnetic structure, I, yeah, it doesn't appear. We just need zero. to move on and give, I mean, because we are running out of time now and we have two more questions. Very quickly, maybe you could answer those. Um, and maybe, Alan, you can have a, a more discussion offline. Um, so uh, Bill Sterling is asking, um, do, you, do your findings depend strongly on the choice of the seven topics? And if I may add to that, for instance, you know, I've noticed, for instance, engineering is, is, is not uh, one of your topics here. So if you yes. change your topics, how yes. will that affect your findings? Uh, yes, it does. So if we if we only ask for three topics, it does then uh, structure, dynamics, and uh, instrumentation. This is how we interpret it. We also had a version with 11, and 11, there's all the circles really start to overlap. So this is a complicated thing. In parallel, we've been working on the 
uh, on the whole corpus and looking at other topics. And at this moment, it seems that we should probably choose eight topics, but this is work which is actually being done at this moment. So I, I only presented here the seven topic uh, uh, thing. So I think most people that are very familiar with Newton scattering and uh, uh, colleges and panels, they will probably like to see more topics. But then for the purpose of our survey and talking to the whole community, we didn't want to only make it readable by the experts, the expert Newton users. We also wanted to have it uh, available for the uh, people that once in a while do Newton scattering. And then I think having more topics would not help them. So this is why we, for the purpose of the survey, we stuck to seven. But you're right. It's it's uh, it's it, then it becomes confusing for the expert. Uh, this yeah. is true. Thank you. Um, very quickly, um, Adrian uh, Adrian no Adrian Rene, um, is the database available for others to investigate or make research with their own ideas? Uh, yeah, yeah. So so the, so the first thing, everything we've done is open source. And uh, uh, we have no intention of keeping what we have uh, to keep that for ourselves. So we're going to work more on it and we want to share it. And the first thing, uh, what we will do is share it with our delegates, but we need to make the software that is now available to us to make it readable for other people and to make sure that they know where all the details and the tricks are. So it should, uh, with time and on not a short and uh, uh, not too short uh, period, it should actually trickle down to all of you if you want through your national delegates. Okay, brilliant. Uh, that sounds really good. And then just to find a final question very quickly, um, Joao Cabral is um, uh, has asked, um, uh, could you correlate the, the increase in number of authors, for instance, with the use of multiple experimental techniques beyond neutrons. Yes. How many people are exclusively neutrons? Yes. So this is what these are one of the. This is exactly one of the things. Very interesting point. This is exactly the thing we're also uh, uh, will do uh, very soon. We first have to finish our brightness work. So this is priority number one. But then, of course, what we've asked. Uh, uh, several uh, uh, many scientists is to uh, give us full text publications. If you have the full text publications, you can find uh, additional techniques and uh, correlate it with that. Indeed, so this is uh, this is something we will be doing in the near future too. Thank you for the suggestion. Right, brilliant. So we need to move on now. I'm afraid. So thank you again for for this great talk. Um, so the, the second talk now is by uh, Christina Edstrom from Uppsala University. Um, I can see you, you're there. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's a talk going to discuss um, neutron research and uh, of batteries. Uh, of course, a very important topic these days. So um, uh, Christina, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I, I'm absolutely thrilled by the previous uh, discussion we had about these, how you can uh, es excavate so much from these uh, publications. But uh, I'll try to focus on batteries now, a little bit different topic, but I can see the same trend. And that is that the number of publications, the number of scientists using Newton techniques are increasing. And um, thank you for allowing me to speak about batteries. Um, I have not so much of new results to show you, so I will make more make a what I would call a perspective discussion about where neutrons are important and where we need to sort of try to find development of new methods, if I can reach to that uh, point, because I think that is where we need to go. And um, I am uh, not only from Uppsala University, I have a research group uh, called the Ångström Advanced Battery Center. We, have, we are about 80 people. We work on every aspect of the battery, uh, experimental, theoretical, um, starting to apply also machine learning, artificial intelligence into our work. Myself, I'm an experimentalist. I was also uh, the main applicant for the Swedish Graduate School for uh, for PhD students in Sweden that could really take the advantage of neutrons. I had, 
handed over that to Martin Salberg in Uppsala, and we have a fantastic study director in Martin Monson from KTH. So it's it's a cross uh, university collaboration in Sweden. Uh, but what I really am doing now, and why I think uh, this sort of discussion on what batteries and neutrons can do. Uh, is that I'm coordinating the large scale research initiative on batteries in Europe and that we have a roadmap and you can find that roadmap in the um, web page we have uh, underneath the logo. And you can also there uh, see that we actually try to link to both uh, Lens and Leaps as the organizations for the different uh, facilities in Europe. And uh, of course uh, we have, uh, we are right now starting with kickoffs uh, for our projects, and that is especially the biggest project that will actually have um, um, facilities uh, of your character on board in the direct project. And I hope we in the future can extend that even more. And the reason why batteries are so important now and so much is of course the Green Deal and that we need to have a fossil free society. Then there are some complications though and that is that when you talk about the battery, you, you, it's a sort of an unclear definition. You start by you having your material, and you need to study the material, the, the bulk uh, structures, the interfaces, and just the synthesis of the material as such influences how good the material, the same material even, is in a battery. And then you have to put it into this testing in the battery cell at lab scale level. And you have to then bring it up closer to upscale and so on into something that soon can go to the commercial cell level. And that is quite slow process. But I think with the beauty of, of neutrons, we're actually learning more of a little bit about the upscaling part compared to the small lab cells, which is very interesting. I'll give you some example on that. And then what's also called the battery is actually the pack. When you take a number of battery cells, maybe I should take this one. You take a number of battery cells and you bring them into a pack or a module and then you put them in your system. So you have to take all this into account when you talk about the battery. And what is more uh, interesting is that we will need the um, neutron techniques in all these steps. And, and one way to explain this is that when you have your material and you see how much of, of active uh, uh, electrochemistry redox reaction you can have in your battery cell, if it's a lithium battery or a sodium battery, I should have said that, that this is a, an example of a lithium battery and this is an example of sodium battery. The, these are the ones that are really now going into, this is, this is the one that is really clearly taking the whole market almost for rechargeable batteries. Uh, and then we have, of course, the sodium battery, which is coming up as a, uh, because of environmental reasons, uh, if, if the raw materials of, of the lithium parts are not enough. But if you go to this, you have the materials, then you make your electrodes and immediately you start by introducing what called dead material, non-active materials. You have current collectors, you have binding materials, etc and you lose a bit of capacity uh, in the total. And then you make your full cell, you have to have packaging materials, etc., and you lose even more. And then you go to the uh, pack and you see the active material. So, so when you talk about how much uh, energy you can have stored in a battery, it's a very big difference between the pack and the battery cell. And this causes a lot of confusion, of course. And then you have the end of life and then you have lost even more of your capacity. And uh, looking at the kind of processes you have here at the different uh, stages, you would say you, you, you really need, need to go to really detailed level of interfaces and, and bulk structures. Here you start also to look at tomographic methods. You're looking at porosity and, and how that evolves with battery cycling and that you do also at the battery cell and you need to see where the atoms are positioned and how they, how they are, are used in the battery cell by doing operando and in situ studies. 
And you even need the capability of neutrons that you can take in larger pieces and have your stress strain and porosity. And of course, when you go to the postmortem, you come back to the start, I will say, where you have the need of going into the details. And I see now publication in the neutron field at all, almost all these levels. Maybe this one is the, the most tricky and difficult one. But in the other ones, I really see very interesting and nice results. And why is this a boom? Why do you make a large scale research initiative for Europe? Why do you put even larger initiatives in Germany for, for battery research and for applied research and so on? And that is that we see this uh, expectation to really rapid transition to the, uh, an electrified society. And if you look at how the expectation is for, uh, for this, uh, for the automotive sector, and look at the production, you see that the demand will mainly be in China and, and also in rest of Asia. And um, EU will be quite uh, large, but uh, on the total, on the global level, it's, it will be not. So there is an actually a very strong drive now to make battery cell production in Europe. And there are a number of initiatives for that. And the whole skill sector in the automotive uh, sector is actually transition, transitioning, and, and we need reskilling of engineers. And in, and in that respect, we also need basic research and to understand what we sort of are doing. So I think you will see a lot of different actions and a very fragmented sort of an attempt from Europe to put this together into something useful for, for um, the industry. Because industry is, is an issue. And if you look at where are these batteries produced, you can see it's, it's China, Korea, Japan. And then you have a little bit in US, and you have a little bit in uh, EU. Um, with the uh, attempt to have Norfolk as our own European uh, size, you have also other uh, initiatives of, of Asian companies moving into Europe, LG, the Korean company's largest uh, factory is actually in Poland. So um, this is a real issue, not to lose jobs and initiatives and maybe new technologies in Europe. And this is then the idea from the commission, how we should increase not only the electric cars, but also the lithium uh, ion battery cells and our global share uh, of cell manufacturing should also increase. So with this, having this Norfolk set up in Sweden saying we will go for a certain chemistry, which is our base chemistry saying we will go for a nickel, cobalt, manganese, cathode material, because that will give us a little bit higher capacity than the commercial batteries you can buy today. Then suddenly Tesla comes up and, and gave a message uh, rocking a little bit the picture two days ago, because they claim that they will decrease the cost of batteries with more than 50%, uh, but they will also increase the poor performance with about the same percentage. And this is something that uh, has been a very large discussion because the price of this battery has dropped dramatically. And that is the reason why we see this electrification and the batteries as a key technology. So, with relevance for, uh, for neutrons, how will Tesla succeed? And uh, how will they actually, uh, and what do I see where neutrons play a role in this competition than with Tesla? Well, they claim that they will have a more effective and cheaper battery production. They re will remove cobalt from the cathode materials. This nickel manganese cobalt I mentioned that is the sort of, the work of uh, uh, Norfolk, and which is challenges uh, when you try to remove it. They will also go for a silicon electrode that can house more lithium than today's graphite. And they will make ba larger battery cells. When the Tesla started, they took small mobile phone uh, batteries and put them together, and they had a lot of copper wires in between to connect them, and it caused a lot of environmental issues. So they have learned a lot. And then they go for a new fabrication technique, how they will make the electrodes reducing the amount of 
solvents, etc., that needed. But I will stay here with the cathode material because you know uh, very well that if you look at the battery and, uh, and look at the lithium battery and you have a positive electrode containing uh, nickel, cobalt, and manganese, it's very difficult to distinguish in the atomic structure where you find um, the distribution of these uh, ions. You need to go to neutrons. And then also, if you want to uh, really have an idea where the lithium is, uh, you also use neutrons because of the, uh, the scattering uh, length, etc. And this battery, yes, to uh, say it's a family of possibilities, a family of chemistries, and that's why you see this interest, because you can be the world record holder of energy content if you really make the best positive electrode paired with a, a good um, negative, but it's really this uh, which is the bottleneck. You have the electrolyte with organic solvents where you have uh, to think of how, how the toxicity and, and also how you can make that uh, more to a solid electrolyte to, to reduce uh, safety issues. But the principle is a sort of a rocking chair concept, and this was given the Nobel Prize last year. And why, what you do is that you have your lithium ions in your positive electrode from the start, and you start by charging your battery, and then you push the lithium ions in between the graphite layers here or let them alloy with silicon, and then you can use your battery. And then, of course, the, the lithium ions are transported in to the atomic structure of the positive electrode. And there are a number of positive electrodes. And the classical that got the Nobel Prize is the lithium cobalt oxide, cheaper one that Tesla also will use for some applications is based on iron. And then you have this lithium nickel cobalt or lithium nickel manganese that gives you more energy. And um, yeah, and the energy you get is the potential you have in the difference between the anode and cathode. And of course, the, uh, the uh, number of elements can transfer. So if you look at the projection of, of why this is a competition, and then you can see on the different nickel, manganese, cobalt materials, they are called NMC uh, for, for battery nerds. And the composition is six nickel, two manganese, two cobalt. You get a certain uh, composition. And when you try to increase the amount of, um, of uh, nickel and reduce the amount of cobalt, you actually increase the capacity and you can make even special um, structures of this and increase the capacity even more. And what now Tesla is trying to do is to go even further by re removing the cobalt. And this is the volumetric capacity. This is the gravimetric one. And the interesting thing is this volumetric, how much of, of uh, energy can you put in a container? And you want to make those small containers. And of course, the question is how to reach uh, um, even higher in capacity than what you see here. And that is a holy grail. And, and one future uh, sort of technology is to go so to solid state and lithium ion batteries and leave out these uh, organic liquid solvents. So, this is why the Tesla now is challenging the gigafactories around the world. Can we easily remove this cobalt? Um, because one problem with the lithium, the, the NMC materials, is that you have these layers here of lithium, and you have slabs of the oxide, and um, you have a risk of having a, a li the lithium ion and the nickel ions intermixing when you make this uh, synthesis. So you always end up with a little bit of nickel blocking the pathway for the lithium transport. So that is uh, one issue. Another issue is if you remove cobalt, so you need the cobalt to really stabilize the structure. It's even worse when you take out the cobalt. Cobalt is also a critical element. And that makes it, if you have it in your battery, recycling is worthwhile. That is where you get the um, profit if you are a recycling company. So they were really refuse 
to even discuss the question that whether we should do this uh, research. And of course, it's a problem with ethical production. Uh, children in Congo is something uh, really important. But then it's also a, a question of, of stability, uh, which is the when you have more and more of the nickel, you have more and more of thinking of long-term stability. And, an automotive company who want to promise eight years for a battery. So I, I think we have learned a lot from neutron techniques and I just want to highlight this example from my colleagues in the Battery 23rd Plus Consortium also working together with Anatoly Sanichin at FRM2, where they really have used the in situ neutron to be able to follow uh, the mechanism which can be co quite complex in some of these nickel cobalt manganese oxide materials. There can be loss of oxygen and, and formation of a different um, defects in the structure, etc. When you have uh, uh, these materials, you can look at densification of the materials to uh, change this, etc. And um, so these reactions during the Delithiation and lithium insertion of material extremely important to know a lot about. And then you often have to compare it with other methods too. But I, I would say that uh, there is a unique selling point for neutrons in this. Another example also from a, a FRM2 is in an aging study of NMC versus graphite, where you can really see how the Lithiation of the graphite is influenced by the long-term cycling and also the impedance of uh, comparing the uncycled and the cycled cell. And you can really see subtle details in the diffraction pattern. And I think this refinement of these are really nice. And what I would like to highlight here is this is detailed understanding, mechanistic understanding. But at the same time, the cell design is made of a company and it's looking almost like a, a real uh, commercial cell. And uh, this size makes also this study more trustworthy than when you work in a little small um, lab cell. So this is really the work of Ralph Schill and uh, what he's doing, what he could see then is that you have a 25% capacity loss upon cycling. And, and the reason for this loss, that is a loss of cyclable lithium and, and it's also both in the graphite and in the NMC cathode. So this detailed evaluation is very important. And this is very useful for industry. And it means that most of their publication actually for in situ neutrons are on some kind of commercial or semi-commercial cells. Here's another example that was shown and discussed yesterday in one of the presentation It's really the Paul Schering's group from UK looking at the tomography, also very applied, <coughs> but very useful. You can see that the electrolyte is drying out, there are cracking of particles, recycling, etc. Um, and you need probably the combination of this sort of almost picture on what's happening and the detailed understanding. And, and the, these details and going to the complexity is something where I think neutrons really is pushed now and uh, where we need to go. So I just want to say a few things about lab cells because this is also an issue where we have to work together from the research side and from the uh, facility side. Notice there are lots of different cells that scientists try to put together. My group has done uh, one in collaboration with ISIS um, and to make them big enough and so on. And it's always a trade-off, a competition with showing really good crystallographic data and really good electrochemistry. And I think this uh, work by, by uh, again, Anatoly from FRM2, Cynthia, China, on taking a pouch cell, which is a prismatic one and being able to rotate it is one step further. Uh, than going also uh, into these. So 
uh, we have to work on the commercial uh, battery cells, but also on developing the lab scale to really understand the mechanism. This is our own little cell we have used uh, at ISIS. We have tried even to make smaller ones, coin cells, really to show really subtle details in structural features. And just to say something about the Tesla uh, ideas and the Tesla, uh, we now go for nickel uh, manganese oxide and they will even increase the nickel more than it's in, in this example. And what is happening then is that you get to much higher voltage where you have this lithium insertion in extraction in these materials compared to where you have for different NMCs and more classical materials. And this influences then the capacity, the volumetric capacity. But if you go to these high um, potential plateaus, you have other problems uh, arising. What is also good uh, with this, uh, uh, what is good with this material is that it has fast lithium diffusion and it's quite environmentally friendly and cheap. But the stability is a question. And what, what structure should we have? If you make this material, it has an ordered phase. It has a disordered phase. And just to make the story quick, the um, disordered phase is usually the better one. And uh, by uh, um, looking at um, uh, the, uh, the uh, disordered phase and looking at the synthesis of this, uh, we can say that um, there we find using the neutrons, some oxygen deficiency. We can find there are changes in the material forming instead of this spinel going to a rock salt phase structure. structure. There are more uh, manganese than nickel. We have a partial ordering. There are changes in particle size and shape. So this work to really penetrate the synthesis conditions to come to the right structure that you really can use is, is what is happening at a number of companies at the moment. And in practice, this material has this uh, more complex than uh, structure. And this is an example from ISIS where we have uh, under ox oxygen flow, try to see where we can have the a change from the order to the disordered phase and uh, learn something about the stability of this uh, sample and, and see where is this so rock salt phase formation occur happening. It turns out that the rock salt formation comes at rather high temperatures, which is of course a, an important sign for, for the synthesis people. But that is not enough uh, because you also have to look at when, what it looks when you are putting it in your battery, when it's cycling. And for the door ordered one with the spinel structure, already quite early after uh, only 10 cycles, lithium out and lithium in, you get the, a very ordered surface structure uh, and you have your bulk structure still as, this, um, as the uh, spinel. And this is very different from the cycling, the disordered sample. So you actually induce structural um, changes just by doing the electrochemistry. And here you have very less of the, uh, very, very little formation of rock salt structure. And this is one explanation uh, why uh, we think that uh, the disordered phase is better. And we need to understand this because we need to understand these formation things and that we only can study in operando mode. And um, so it's not only that we get this rock salt uh, structure, if you then complement this with some surface science technique, you will see you get a lot of what's called um, cathode electrolyte interface layer, mushy organic species and salt residues, and much less uh, and much thinner uh, on the uh, and disordered one. And uh, this kind of, of work we need to do for a lot of new um, chemistries in, in the battery field coming up that is conquering the lithium ion battery in the long run. We have the solid state with lithium metal. We have different uh, divalent batteries. We have lithium sulfur, which is also seen as quite soon coming out as commercial product 
production. We have organic batteries. We have even aluminum coming up. So uh, there is even more coming in the future. <laughs> so we are invading you as ne neutron facilities. And my take home message really for the new to community is that it's a really complex uh, picture going on in these materials and how you engineer them. And, and I think yeah, we have still a lot to learn and that your neutron uh, techniques are so important for this. Uh, and this is what we are going to do in budget 2030 plus with Matthias acceleration plus. Hey, Christina, Christina. Yes. You are out of time. I was just, I, I was actually thinking you've already finished by now. But, uh, I'm finished by now. Any more slides? No, not really. My, uh, my end was to say that we have this battery 2030 plus. We have an acceleration materials platform where we need high throughput experiments, a lot of data to handle artificial in intelligence. And we want to work with really leaps and lens on this. Uh, along the value chain, and uh, thank you. Yeah, your attention. Thank you, Christine. And sorry for cutting you short a little no, bit at no, the no. end. It was, I was, it was very interesting. So I, I, you know, I didn't want to interrupt you. And um, and since we have a break, you know, we probably can over in a few minutes. So I actually, so there are a few questions. And in fact, um, uh, since Mark don't, can can't uh, ask in the question room, but um, Mark, you want to actually turn on your microphone and ask the question yourself? Yeah, I've just done that, Michael. So thank you. And thank you very much, Christina, for a, for a very nice overview of, of battery research. Um, my, my question is, how can facilities do more to, to, to contribute to this uh, very important effort? You know, we, we provide beam time typically through proposal systems. And we have some electrochemistry capability, dedicated glove box, battery cycling equipment, and so on. But, you know, in the ideal world for you, what more could or should we do to support this work? Well, I, I of course, um, there are two things. Uh, scientists always want time, but I know also how important it is with excellence in research so that has to be balanced. But I think in this case that it's also important that we could be discussing development of techniques. And uh, in uh, our uh, flagship um, big map work, uh, which is the big project where also I think ILL is a partner, uh, and I hope also, and where we have started a dialogue, we have had a special meeting in Paris before every, uh, the COVID broke down and we invited uh, ESS that couldn't come, uh, MAX4, uh, both synchrotron and neutron facilities. And I think to continue this dialogue now when we have this project, it has its kickoff here two weeks from now, uh, and then we can start a dialogue. I think that's the first thing that we have to sit together and discuss what do we need and how do we look upon this? Because we, as a scientist community in Battery 2030 plus. We really would like to have that interaction. And we are open to all of you. I mean, we like to have all of you in a platform. I think we invited most of you and, and most of you come, came, but not everyone. Okay, thank you. I think we're, we're very much open to suggestions and to seeing how we mm -hmm. can uh, adapt and evolve what we sort of traditionally do to, you know, so that we can fully participate in and contribute to these important efforts. So thank you. Yes, and I can tell you, I already now know that I will, this is a three year project, but I already now know that there is a wish from the commission to continue with a longer effort around this big map that we try to make this as an instrument which is stable for the whole duration of Horizon Europe. Thank you. Um, so there's also a question by Thomas Good Goodpellet. Uh, thank you for this impressive talk. Can you comment on the option of sodium-based batteries and their perspective? I think sodium batteries are, are, are very interesting. Uh, we didn't think uh, a number of years ago that we could do room temperature sodium batteries. We have learned a lot from the lithium. 
Um, there are lots of SME companies coming up now with uh, ideas and solution, and they are actually coming more and closer and closer to the market. I think you will see them. And I think they can actually release the pressure on the lithium for some certain sectors. I slurped a little bit uh, over the needs of batteries uh, in my introduction. And I could see that um, and large case storage is one uh, to store uh, solar energy and so on. There you have uh, a niche for sodium batteries, but also that they are cheap and it's not really a geopolitical issue with this in the same way as it is for lithium. You don't find lithium everywhere, for instance. I don't know. Thank if you. Thank you. For that. I think that was, was very <laughs> market oriented. I think that was a very clear answer. Thank you. Um, and then uh, a final question by Klaus Dieterlis. Um, so you're invading, uh, you're, you said you're invading neutron facilities. And we Do would you, like to, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Do you also <laughs> intend to invade high energy X-ray synchrotrons? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. We are uh, promiscuous. We, uh, we, 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 no, but the complexity, uh, which I tried to show with this uh, overview sketch, that it means that you have to use several techniques to understand one complex problem. One, one technique is not solving the whole and giving you the whole picture. So x-rays are extremely important. And I had not time, but all the surface science was made at, at BESI uh, using HACSPES actually to have depth profiling using synchrotron. So uh, yes, we are. But the previous um, discussion showing how the publications on, on these topics are spreading, you could probably find a lot from the battery community utilizing synchrotron techniques, for instance. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Free for, electron. Yeah. Thank you very much for 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 the answer. So we have run out of time now. We've actually run over time a little bit, but we have. But we since we now have a break. Well, it says coffee break. To be honest with you, for me, it's probably more a bit of a beer break at this time of the evening. Um, so it depends on which time zone you live. Uh, you will have you have a whatever break you have now, uh, and it's only I'm afraid eight minutes before we all meet. Uh, again, and thanks again, Christina, for this really nice talk. Thank you. affected in many cases. The target building is weather tight and the high bay crane has been installed. We have started on the signature roof nicknamed the sombrero. Work is ongoing on both instrument halls surrounding the target building. And installation work is ongoing in preparation for the target vessel to arrive. In the accelerator tunnel, installations of the cryo system have continued. Here we can see the connection between the accelerator tunnel and the target area, where the so-called dog leg will be. During the second quarter, the accelerator cryo plant has been commissioned at its highest capacity, which enables the cooling required for the superconducting LINAC to reach its full beam on target. In the instrument hall for the long instruments, the cave for the NMX instrument is close to finished. Work is ongoing on the cave for Bifrost as part of the preparations that are being made for the first set of instruments that will be ready for first science in 2023.
behind the instrument halls are the laboratory buildings that were almost fully equipped when the work had to stop due to the pandemic. After adopting the workplace to the new safety requirements, the installations will be completed with no delays. Last but not least, the ESS campus, with office spaces for all ESS staff, is almost finished. The Move to Campus project has been initiated to secure the possibility to move in as planned in the first quarters of 2021. Even though we're not all in Lund every day, we do progress in building a facility with the aim of getting first science in 2023. We call it business as unusual. to optimize your products? Do you need to analyze how your preparations behave? Why not use SANS, small angle neutron scattering? SANS lets you explore the microstructure of liquids and solids at scales ranging from one nanometer to one tenth of a micron. Why is it useful to know their microstructure? Imagine you want to manufacture a shampoo with a brand new active molecule. The problem with active molecules is that they are often hydrophobic. They dilute very little in water and shampoo is an aqueous preparation that is used beneath water. Therefore, the active molecules are encapsulated in aggregates of surfactants, but the mixture is very liquid and not very practical to use. So, a thickener is also added to the mixture, but manufacturers don't want an excessively viscous, glue-like mixture that is difficult to get out of the bottle. So, how do you best proportion each ingredient to obtain an attractive shampoo? which is stable in a wide temperature range and over time, and which is easy to rinse off. This is when things start to get really tricky. SANS measurements help you optimize your formulations. They let you observe how the molecules in your shampoo are organized. How does this work? A product sample is placed in a SANS instrument. The instrument is temperature controlled, and an injection system allows blending if necessary. A beam of neutrons is directed at the sample. The matter of the shampoo deflects some neutrons from their trajectory. A large detector records the position of these deflected neutrons. The result is curious figures, which the experts will analyze. This measurement makes it possible to determine the shapes, sizes, and spatial organization of the scatters of structures in your shampoo, ranging from one nanometer to one tenth of a micron. It's even possible to detail the size and nature of the lipid layers or bilayers, the barriers that encapsulate the active molecules. SANS is a major technique that is also applied to many other systems, polymers, colloids, biological macromolecules, emulsions, pores in solids, aggregates in alloys, and even magnetic microstructures. Available in neutron centers, SANS gives you a novel perspective on the organization of microstructures. ESS is located on the outskirts of Lund, a city with a long, rich history. It's built on the border between the city and the countryside on 75 hectares of land, and it is here the future will be formed. This is where it all starts, the iron source manufactured by INFN in Italy. Plasma is created from hydrogen gas and the protons are separated from the electrons. These protons are then drawn into the accelerator, where they're accelerated to speeds approaching the speed of light. The 602.5 meter long accelerator is divided into a warm section, a cold section, and a section for which is set aside for future upgrades. What we see here is mostly the cryogenic system that will cool the accelerator. While the accelerator tunnel is mostly 8 meters below ground, the equipment that powers it is placed in the gallery on ground level. They are connected through stubs placed along the tunnel. 
When the protons hit the tungsten target wheel, the spallation occurs, and the neutrons are released from the tungsten nuclei. A moderator then collects and moderates the neutrons before they're guided towards the instruments. ESS will have three instrument holes surrounding the target. The largest is for the long instruments, which are up to 180 meters from the target. ESS will have 15 instruments online by 2026 and has planned for a total of 22 state-of-the-art instruments. This is where the magic takes place. Each instrument is tailor-made by scientists, for scientists, to make the most of the neutrons. As a facility focused on the users, ESS will provide the scientists with beam time at an instrument, as well as a scientist that can help these visiting researchers make the most out of every instrument. The ESS campus, where the scientists will stay during their time at ESS, includes a restaurant, auditorium, conference rooms and office space for all ESS employees. We will move in at the beginning of 2021. ESS has more than 500 employees, representing over 50 nationalities. First science is set to take place in 2023. We will deepen our understanding of the world around us and perform research on scales never seen before. Together, we're on our way to change the world for the better. Welcome back, everybody, from, from, from the break. Uh, and I apologize, it was a bit of a short break, um, but a break nevertheless. <laughs> so, um, we, so welcome to the now second part of the morning session. And the first speaker is Pavel Strunz from, uh, from the uh, Physical, Nuclear Physics Institute in, in the Czech Republic. And he's going to talk about structural materials or engineering materials. So, uh, Pavel, um, are you ready? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, excellent. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can, yeah, can see so, dear colleagues, uh, I have to admit that I am not a frequent uh, IL user. Nevertheless, I will show in my talk also some IL data so then perhaps I'm qualified to deliver a talk at this user meeting on the investigation of some advanced metallic materials by our team from Nuclear Physics Institute. Another qualification, hopefully it works, yes. Another qualification is that our team is strongly involved in ESS project, particularly in the construction of uh, materials engineering diffractometer DEER. Before switching to the core of my uh, talk, I uh, can't avoid to tell a couple of more general sentences. Basically, uh, where neutron scattering can be uh, very helpful for the uh, field of materials research and materials engineering is uh, to determine uh, is determination of structure and microstructure. It is particularly extremely helpful for optimization of thermomechanical properties, uh, uh, thermomechanical processing, in order to improve mechanical properties for structural stability preservation or for lifetime increase. Or we can use it also uh, to have a better knowledge of on the material which is or can be of interest for humankind. But uh, this is not a strategic talk at some material science conference, therefore I will not elaborate this list uh, more deeply. I will only say where neutrons can be uh, particularly helpful for us in these fields. They can deliver bulk information even for large grain materials, and they can deliver it in situ, for example, at operation temperatures. I will try to uh, show these properties of neutrons on the examples of on the selected examples 
from the investigation of uh, metallic materials, particularly tungsten heavy alloys, metastable beta titanium alloys, magnesium and cobalt arenium high temperature alloys. The first example is uh, relatively simple uh, from the point of view of neutron diffraction. Uh, it's about tungsten heavy alloys, which is important material. And I listed here also the people who collaborated on this research and to whom I am thankful. So tungsten heavy alloys uh, are in fact composites where hard tungsten particles are embedded in a soft matrix. They have good mechanical properties, high specific, uh, specific mass, and therefore they are quite suitable for kinetic penetrators, gyroscope rotors, and radiation shielding. We particularly investigated tungsten alloy, which contain, contain, contained uh, nickel and cobalt, and which was produced by powder metallurgy. Properties of such uh, alloy can be still improved by severe plastic deformation, in our case, we used a method which is called rotary swedging. Sinter bars were processed by rotary swedging at ambient temperature and at 900 degrees of centigrade. Swedging changed quite significantly the mechanical properties, which can be seen from this strain stress curve. An important step to optimize microstructure is to understand the underlying processes and that was the aim of the neutron diffraction study, to determine microstrain, characterize the dislocations and active slip system. So here is shown a first diffractogram, one of the measured diffractograms at ambient temperature. First, it helped to uh, identify the phases. The main phase is uh, in fact uh, tungsten, original powder grains, but the second phase that is also present uh, those are, uh, those, this is in fact matrix and uh, this is a nickel cobalt phase, uh, nickel-like solid solution of FCC structure. There is visible some peak broadening for the matrix phase, uh, but first before talking about peak broadening, I will show also the result of neutron, uh, of texture measurement by neutron diffraction. You can see uh, from the pole figures that there is no texture at the beginning in both phases, uh, but in the second phase, there are these large spots show us that there are large grains, even from the point of view of neutron diffraction. Rotary swedging uh, fractioned these large grains and also it, uh, these inverse pole figures show us that they built a quite large deformation texture in both phases. And this type of phases, uh, type of Texture is the same as for wire drawing. That means that highly probably the, the formation mechanism is the same as for wire drawing. The second thing is that you can see that qualitatively the same texture is for cold swedging and for hot swedging. But in the second case for hot swedging, there is smaller texture. That means uh, in this case, there was most probably active also uh, secondary deformation mechanism. Now back to the peak broadening. Here is modified Williamson Hall plot for uh, uh, matrix phase. We can, we can see that soft nickel cobalt phase, uh, the microstrain in this phase increased after swedging three times. And also that uh, the edge dislocation with 110 uh, one, and 111 slip system fits bet, best the the uh, straight line in this modified Williamson Hall plot, which means that it is the same result as for uh, texture measurement. Uh, and uh, there is uh, nothing special. This is typical, typical uh, for deformation texture in FCC structures. Uh, interesting is that uh, here in this S-centered bar, uh, the best fit we get for screw dislocation uh, with 111 orientation. We were also able to determine dislocation densities from the uh, measured data. You can see that uh, after swedging, the dislocation density is increased on somehow five times. Uh, and uh, this means that the dislocation densities increase is the 
cause for the strengthening of the material, which is visible here. For cold switch material, there is 15% higher dislocation density than for hot switching, which also is in the same trend. Uh, well, there is some list of uh, sentences about summary of this uh, research. I will not repeat this uh, but because I said it a couple of seconds ago. And I will directly go to the second topic of my uh, talk, which are metastable beta titanium alloys. Again, I list here the contributors to this research uh, together with their affiliations. Uh, high specific strength, high corrosion resistance, and biocompatibility, those are characteristics of titanium alloys, and therefore they are predetermined for the use in aerospace industry, but also uh, for implants. Special class of these alloys are metastable beta titanium alloys, where du uh, during the quenching from beta phase region, there appears fine structure of hexagonal omega phase, and this can grow on uh, further heating. And because it has significant effect on ductility and strength, the microstructure of precipitate microstructure of omega phase uh, does work to investigate thoroughly. Uh, when talking about uh, precipitates, uh, the best technique to use is uh, small angle neutron scattering. Uh, I show here some data from measured at ILL in, at D11. And uh, this data are from T-metal LCB, uh, T-metal LCB single crystals. The aim of this research was uh, to determine microstructure of omega after annealing, particularly to determine uh, morphology. So we had a series of differently annealed samples, which were cut uh, along three uh, crystallographic planes. And uh, in these uh, graphs, the grayscale means uh, measured data and white equi intensity levels is the fit to the data using this three dimensional model of dense spheres uh, which represent omega precipitates. When we evaluate all the data, we determine some morphological parameters, uh, morphology parameters, uh, well, the size, uh, uh, there is nothing very special for the size and cooling fraction. I want to point out two things. First is that we obtain more ordered system of omega particles for longer annealing times. And the second point is that the model of such prolate ellipsoids doesn't fit uh, uh, better the measured data than the model of spheres. So the best fitting are the, is the spherical model of spheres, uh, dense model of spheres. But where neutron scattering is particularly strong, uh, it is uh, in a situ measurement, here it is shown on the single crystal of titanium 15% molybdenum. That means slightly different uh, alloy than the previous one. And the previous neutron diffraction done in IRL uh, was able to identify the phases, but it was not, uh, uh, let's say, con conclusive about the morphology size and omega and alpha phase overlap. So that was the aim for the in-situ small angle neutron scattering study. Uh, video here shows uh, the heating of the uh, well, scattering patterns from the heating, uh, in situ heating of the material up to 600 degrees of centigrade. As the scattering patterns are strongly anisotropic, we can conclude about even about morphology of the precipitates. And it is quite sure in this uh, case that there are no spheres, but those are uh, the omega precipitates are rather prolate spheroids. Uh, yeah, prolate spheroids. And uh, we can also conclude on the omega phase growth, uh, which is depicted here. From my point of view, very interesting is 
alpha phase monitoring above uh, some temperature level. It is shown in detail here in this slide. Uh, when we do fine binning of the data, we can see that uh, at 553 degrees of centigrade, there is omega still present, the same at 557, but already at these temperatures, the streaks from alpha phase appear. That means that we have uh, overlap of omega and alpha, and also it's sure that alpha forms in thin plates because we see streaks here in this orientation, but not in, here in this orientation. When we, go, when we go further to 561, we see that there is already no omega, but there are uh, streaks of alpha, but there is another appearing another set of streaks from alpha better visible at 584 at high temperature. So that means that we have two, in fact, two set of uh, streaks. Uh, working hypothesis is that the first set of streaks comes from alpha, which is formed in omega, while the second from alpha, which is formed in beta, uh, beta matrix. Again, <clears throat> there are some uh, sentences about uh, what is the output of this research, uh, but I think that this is a good place to put a, here a note that in situ neutron diffraction and small angular neutron scattering could be done together, uh, which would bring a better complementary information on polycrystals. For example, in case uh, we have early stages of precipitation or uh, we have uh, to find something about phase transformation sequences. So the third topic which I would like to report on is the formation mechanism in magnesium polycrystals. Uh, this was done in close collaboration with the group of Christian Matis from Charles University. A couple of words about the material. Magnesium alloys are very low density structural metals and therefore they are interesting for transportation industry, but they are also used in electronics. Application is, however, limited. One of the reasons is uh, low formability at ambient temperature, and therefore the study of deformation properties of magnesium and its alloys is very important. It is, however, still a challenging task because uh, magnesium has unique deformation behavior, very different from BCC or FCC metals, as it has ACP structure. So preferred mechanism for deformation is twinning, but there is also very important dislocation slip. Uh, by neutron diffraction, we can study twin volume, we can study dislocation densities, or we can also do quantitative comparison of the activity of particular slip system. All these things are important for experimental testing of uh, deformation model validity. It's also very advantageous to combine neutron diffraction with acoustic emission. When you put a sensor for acoustic emission or your material and you deform it, you can hear some sound. And the main, uh, main source for this signal comes from nucleation and propagation of the winds or from collective motion of the dislocations. So, uh, detecting this signal, you can gain some information about the dynamic processes which are involved in plastic deformation. I would like to show experiment of nearly pure magnesium, where we performed neutron diffraction uh, experiment in situ with deformation rig on beam in two modes, in tension and compression at room temperature. One of the measured diffractograms is shown here. Here it is for compression, six percent straining, and it was done at SMART. First thing which we can determine is the evolution of twin volume during the deformation. Schematically, it is shown here that we can determine from the evolution of 0002 peak uh, of uh, hexagonal phase of my, uh, magnesium, magnesium hexagonal packed phase. And uh, in fact, uh, 
you determine the thin volume from the area under this uh, uh, this curve uh, from the axial distribution function for this 002 peak. And you plot uh, the result uh, in dependence on strain, you get uh, the dependence of uh, thin volume for compression for tension, they differ. And you can compare this also with uh, the modeling of deformation mechanism. Those are these uh, straight lines. Uh, the trend is the same. You can see that the model also predicts the difference between compression and tension. Uh, it can be also said that the model could be still a little bit improved to fit better with the measured data. When we compare with acoustic emission signal, we can see that at the beginning of uh, uh, straining, there is the major part of the acoustic emission signal, in both cases compression and tension. It means that uh, thin enucleation, which is detectable by, by acoustic emission, uh, occurred mainly in the initial phase uh, of the straining, while uh, <clears throat> afterwards uh, the twin grows, this thickening of the twin phase. Twin growth occurred afterwards. And this is not detectable by acoustic emission, but it is detect detectable by neutron diffraction. So neutron diffraction and acoustic emission are complementary. Further, we can also use speed broadening for some other conclusions. We perform a profile analysis of diffraction pattern, whole, whole uh, diffraction pattern profile analysis. Uh, with microstrain bro micro broadening parameters coming from dislocations. When we do it, we get, again, a uh, modified Williamson hole plot, which tells us that our uh, assumption about dislocation cause broadening was correct. And we can determine the dislocation densities, again, for larger stainings, different for tension and compression. Again, the parameter which can be compared with uh, the formation mechanism models. Having uh, very good statistics uh, of the data, we can do still finer analysis. Particularly, we can determine the fraction of uh, basal and non-basal dislocations. And uh, this can be combined uh, with the advantage with acoustic emission results, particularly with uh, energy and frequency analysis, which is shown here. In this way, you can decouple different contributions to the deformation. And for example, plot uh, uh, recognized that first in the compression, first uh, they are coming basal dislocations uh, and then slip from non-basal dislocations takes place. Uh, I will not go into the very details for this uh, uh, research. And I would like at the end of this part to tell two notes. First is that the combination of neutron diffraction with acoustic emission is very advantageous. And uh, second, very intense neutron source could allow fully simultaneous neutron diffraction with acoustic emission during straining at some reasonable strain rates uh, for some tasks like twin volume determination. The last part of my talk is about uh, matrix stability of cobalt uranium alloys uh, containing boron. I will uh, start a little bit broadly for this topic uh, because energy is the nowadays the topic number one or maybe number two after COVID. Uh, energy sources, for energy source, you can use sun, which is clean and quite popular. And to make the point easy, I will compare it with only one other energy source, which is fuel here represented by these wood pieces. Energy conversion uh, can be done for sunshine quite easily nowadays, and you can convert it to electricity in such way that you can use it even for flying through the air in such machine called solar impulse too. Uh, Problem is a little bit that uh, the sunshine is non-dense uh, energy, and then you have to have wingspan of this machine, something like 70 meters, which is comparable with Boeing. Okay, let's compare it with Boeing. Uh, 
Boeing has seating capacity 600, while uh, this machine has one. The speed, maximum speed here is 90, here is 900. So that means the passenger flow ratio here is something like 6,000. I admit, of course, that uh, in the future, the sunshine can be possibly competitive, but uh, at present, uh, we will most probably use such type of machine and combustion for flying through the air. Uh, it has to be done, however, not in this primitive way, of course, but here in the turbine, and it has to be that, uh, done as efficiently as possible. Gas turbines, they need high temperature materials because the temperature uh, determines the efficiency. Uh, materials here in the high temperature part of the turbine have to stand the high temperatures, for example, these turbine blades. And uh, nowadays they are used mainly nickel-based super alloys for this purpose. However, nickel-based super alloys are concerning the base metal temperature limit. They are at the end uh, of their possibilities and this limit can be hard, uh, hardly exceeded. So we need to look for another material for this purpose. And the aim is in the first step to find the alloy which is able to be about uh, 100 Kelvin above the nickel-based super alloys. Good candidate is cobalt rhenium alloys. Uh, one for important for, point for cobalt rhenium alloys that they are hexagonal at room temperature and they can undergo uh, transformation from low temperature HCP to high temperature FCC at some point. Alloying additions to these alloys provide them oxidation resistance, strength, creep resistance, and ductility. But I'm going to talk about uh, boron addition, which provides ductility. It works. You can see that uh, with zero boron addition, there is such low ductility. With 500 ppm, there is such a large increase. It's good. But we have to also care about stability, because we know that boron is FCC stabilizer, which can shift transformation temperature ACP to FCC to lower values. And if the decrease is uh, significant, then it is problem because we would cycle or HCP FCC transformation during operation. It can bring structural instability. So neutron diffraction tasks was to determine the trend in the transformation temperature, this FCC start uh, with increasing boron content. So we measured this uh, at Garching, at Stutzbeck machine, uh, in the temperature range from air, room temperature to 1500 degrees of centigrade. At room temperature, the diffractogram shows hexagonal phase with some sigma phase in between. At high temperatures, uh, 1500 degrees of centigrade, there is only FCC phase with some sigma phase still visible. And we can also determine the structure in between uh, in some uh, limited angular range, but sufficient to see hexagonal peaks, FCC peaks, and sigma peaks. When we evaluate this for all our boron containing samples, we can see uh, the evolution of uh, boron fraction of HCP, FCC, and also sigma phase. And the most important is that we are able for all uh, boron contents. Uh, determine this FCC start temperature. Okay, when we plot it, uh, that means different dependence of transformation temperature here represented by the black points and black starts. Uh, independence on the boron content, we see that initially there is some decrease, 50 to 100 kelvins uh, after adding boron. If it continues, this is problematic because then uh, alloy would not be usable. It would be, uh, the transformation temperature would be too low. Fortunately, this is not the case for still increasing boron content. There is increase of transformation temperature again. And the reason for this is uh, sigma content, which is lower at higher temperatures. And uh, as sigma is chromium-uranium type phase, 
that means if there is slower amount of sigma, there is higher amount of radium and chromium that is solved in the matrix. And as radium and chromium are HCP stabilizer, this pushes the transformation temperature still to higher temperatures. So it's good. And I will summarize my talk by telling that I hope that I shown that structure and microstructure parameters uh, were extracted for su some types of advanced metallic materials with a large help of neutron scattering. And I further, I will not tell something new when I declare that the main strength of neutron scattering lies in in-situ measurements that we can combine uh, neutron diffraction with uh, sophisticated techniques like acoustic emission, and it is uh, highly welcome. And also intense neutron source and large detector coverage can bring still more coherent information in case of uh, kinetic processes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pavel. Um... Thank you for this nice talk and uh, some really nice examples of um, very advanced research in the field of structural material, metallurgy, and the utilization of uh, neutron diffraction. Um, I have, you know, you, you mentioned the um, you mentioned the research on magnesium and the, the you know the texture evolution doing processing and the, the importance of twinning there, which of course has a massive effect on the, on the texture. So you, you showed the work you've done there with, you know, um, using uh, SMART. Um, so have you actually um, utilized all those data in, in, in further developing crystal plasticity models that can predict those textures and, uh, uh, you know, to actually, you know, understand better the, 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 you know, how we can actually improve um, the texture and also the formability of the material. Uh, to be honest, I am not an uh, expert uh, in this uh, uh, deformation models. Uh, this is rather the question to Christian Matis. But I really hope that the neutron deflection data helped to improve the, the, this, uh, this uh, uh, self-consistent models, but to be honest, I cannot answer in detail this question. Yeah, no, I, I, okay, that's that's fine. I mean, I understand. I mean, it, the interesting thing about these things, maybe just for, for the audience here, is that that actually, we, you know, the, the, the field is much better developed on the experimental side than the modeling side. Uh, and, and modeling plasticity mm -hmm. in, in materials in, in, in metals is it's much more complex, much more difficult than, than people can can imagine. And so there's a there's a real there's there are real challenges there, um, um, which you know is becoming in a way a problem for the experimentalists, because the experimentalists can do very nice experiments using neutron diffraction, yeah. and with, with forward you know, going forward uh, looking forward with beer. Will be doing be able to do actually even better experiments, but the the modeling side is is, is a real issue. Um, I have one quick question here from from, from Klaus Diederlis. Uh, magnesium twinning occurs at room temperature. At higher temperature, however, you recover. Uh, uh, you have recovery and other microstructure changes. There's a lot of play going to work it out by in situ diffraction. So I think that's more common. Yes, then, that's um, true. Uh, yeah, and he just says that it's more common than, and that's of course, yeah, it's absolutely right. Um, I think the issue is, of course, the the grain refinement you also try to achieve during the thermomechanical processing. So I, I think we just leave it here because we've run out of time anyway. So thank you again, about, um, thank you uh, for the, for the really nice talk. And uh, so, uh, Pavel, so we need to move on to the next talk, and that's the final talk of the morning session. Well morning session if you are in the, in the, in, in the European time zone. Uh, and, and that is uh, a talk by Tamin Davish from, from ANSTO. And you can already see the title here. Uh, so we are now going to look at deuterium and you know, development of deuteration for neutron applications. So uh, over to you, Tamin, and uh, I hope you're there. Yeah. 
can you see me? Yeah, and yeah, see well, the slides. Yeah, see excellent. Most importantly, I can see the slides. Excellent. Um, so yeah, thanks, Michael, for the introduction and. Uh, and uh, also, this is, I guess, the, the first time I can say um, uh, to the audience, um, good morning, um, good afternoon, um, good evening, and uh, probably good night for some of us all over, uh, all over the world, um, um, trying to watch um, uh, and listen to the, um, to the talks. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure, and I'd like to thank the organizing uh, committee for giving me the chance uh, to um, to talk about the deuteration uh, advancements in, uh, in deuteration science and in the world of uh, neutron applications. Um, it's really impressive, uh, the interaction that's happening on the social media that I was uh, watching yesterday. Um, you know, it's a, it's a new way of communication that's, um, you know, um, it's great, but I, I think nothing um, would be better than the face-to-face -face, um, read interaction. So hopefully we'll get back to, to that soon. Um, so what I will talk today, uh, let me see if I can see, my, okay, I can get my slides here. I can't see my uh, cursor, unfortunately, uh, but that's fine. Um, so in my talk uh, today, I actually decided uh, to um, uh, not focus on case studies and how deuteration is important uh, for neutrons um, and give you uh, papers and, and show you the, you know, some good science there. I, I, I decided not to focus on this uh, for the first time. And, and uh, what I decided is to give you a summary, uh, especially for the user community, the neutron user community, uh, to give you a summary of the deuteration ca uh, capabilities from the National Deuteration Facility, um, as well as other uh, deuteration facilities around the world. So, um, so I'll be light on science today, sorry for that. But I'll talk about how to access uh, such capabilities, um, what is the supply, the demand, and the impact um, by having such uh, deuteration facilities um, complementing and contributing to the deuteration, uh, to the to the neutron uh, applications and uh, neutron studies. So in the outline um, here for the novice users of deuteration and um, and um, neutron applications, uh, deuteration and neutron, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how deuteration uh, is important and why it's needed for neutron scattering, uh, reflectometry, diffraction, and crystallography. And then I'll move and give an overview of ANSTO and the National Deuteration Facility, um, uh, and I'll give you an um, overview on the modes of access, the capability from the deuteration facility. Um, and then I will talk about other deuteration facilities, their, their type um, uh, and their specialty and access. And also I will um, uh, talk about briefly, uh, summarize some challenges uh, that we all experience as a first, uh, neutron facility, um, um, uh, facilities around the world. And uh, at the end, I will talk about the demand and supply and some impact um, uh, studies uh, from uh, our users, uh, from the National Deuteration Facility users. So I'll start uh, just to, I'd like to start with this image, which shows um, really demonstrate the difference between protonated material and deuterated material. And uh, they look the same. Uh, almost behave the same, but they have some interesting differences that can be utilized um, in, ca in characterization. So here you have the um, two different type of ice. One is made from H2O and one is made from heavy water, D2O. Um, the, the difference in density will make the uh, ice made uh, from D2O sink while the uh, ice made from light water uh, uh, float, uh, basically they uh, float in light water. Now, this is in terms of density, material or mass density, but when we talk about neutrons, we talk uh, there about uh, the scattering length density. So in deuterated material, I will have different scattering length density than protonated one, and that's how it is utilized in uh, neutron uh, studies. So, in neutron scattering, you have uh, um, uh, contrast matching is the is the is the uh, the trick or the phenomena that you use, 
Uh, this is just an, an optical analogy of how light interacts with matter. It's the same analogy you can uh, think of neutron interacting with deuterated material and proton material. You can make uh, material invisible in the matrix of D2O, H2O by deuterating them to a certain level. So you can, in, uh, with SANS, uh, small uh, angle neutron scattering, you'll be able to uh, look at uh, multiple or multi-component systems by deuterating uh, some of these uh, components and leave the other ones protonated. In, this is in SANS. In reflectometry, um, deuteration is important because it can uh, differentiate between similar, um, uh, provide contrast between different thin films. So when you do reflectometry, you'd like to distinguish between different uh, uh, um, films or thin films. This is an example of light emitting diode, OLED, deuterating the, uh, the different organic layers. You will be able to uh, look at or see how the different um, layers are interacting or diffusing to one another by using neutron reflectometry. The other importance or, uh, or the use of deuteration um, is in the uh, neutron diffraction or crystallography. Um, neutron, basically by removing protons uh, from the crystal, uh, you reduce the incoherent noise scattering that comes from the protons. And, and this will allow uh, smaller crystals to be um, uh, to be uh, tested uh, by neutron crystallography. You'll have shorter diffraction time and you can actually use weaker neutron sources and detectors. This is uh, just an example here. Um, if uh, two type of material or uh, one type of material deuterated HD exchange and one, the other one on the right is pair deuterated um, cholesterol oxidase. If you um, deuterate or pair deuterate, you will be able to see a nice flow of nuclear dense, uh, density maps, especially for the CH2s, because hydrogen or carbon have a positively scattering um, and uh, neighboring to negatively uh, scattering um, hydrogens means that the electron density or the nuclear density will be almost zero. But uh, when you deuterate that, that would give you a nice um, a flow of density. So you'll be able to have better crystallographic uh, data. So that's how it is used in crystallography. And in diffraction, of course, you remove the diffraction noise. Oh, the, uh, sorry, the incoherent scattering noise of hydrogens. So a very brief um, introduction about ANSTO. ANSTO is one of country's largest public research organization and the custodian of much of country's national research infrastructure. We're located in three different campuses um, um, in Australia, one in uh, Lucas Heights and one in Camperdown uh, and, and the other one in Victoria Clayton. Um, the, uh, the nuclear uh, facility or the, the neutron facility is in Lucas Heights and that's where the deuteration facility is located. Um, here, um, just showing that the NDF is one of the 10 uh, research infrastructure platforms of, of ANSTO. Uh, these platforms are categorized as a landmark and national um, and institutional re research infrastructure. Uh, NDF is one of the uh, national research infrastructure. And we, this is just an image from the top of Lucas Heights. That's where Opel is. Sorry, I can't see my uh, cursor there, um, but I hope you can see the Opel where the nuclear reactor, the uh, open pool, uh, light water, strain and light water nuclear reactor, which produces the neutrons for the neutrons, um, neutron, uh, uh, scattering um, uh, of the ACNS, uh, uh, Australian Center for Neutron um, Science. Uh, the chemical deuteration and biodeuteration buildings uh, on the same site, and we're about 30 k from the Sydney CBD. So the deuteration, any deuteration facility, I'll be talking more about NDF, of course, because that's where I work, but any deuteration facility is really, is, is not only the infrastructure and equipment, but also is the know-how and the expertise that are required for deuterating and purifying molecules. 
the, the, the variety of molecules requested and the bespoke synthesis and biosynthesis involved um, basically means that there is a large component of research or large research component. And that, that's really needed, uh, that comes with um, training and expertise uh, and uh, that is involved in the process. So the NDF, um, we provide deuterated molecules for researchers and industry. Uh, we're a group of uh, chemists, biochemists and biologists. Uh, we produce uh, molecules by um, multiple means, uh, by chemical means, uh, biological and biochemical. Um, here uh, we've got the protein expression, uh, the, uh, the chemical synthesis, and also uh, lately we've been doing uh, engineered yeast and separation science for deuterated product uh, produced by yeast. So we've got the research infrastructure, the expertise, the know-how, and also we provide our uh, facility labs uh, to train um, other users. Um, and we have occasions where other facilities, our deuteration facilities, um, uh, that came and actually got training uh, with us uh, and also users that they can come and do their deuterated molecules um, in our labs. So the different type of access, uh, we've got three different types to access NDF. Uh, the first is the merit uh, and it's uh, usually happens um, two times a year, uh, mid-March and uh, mid-September. Uh, the criteria for uh, for this is that you need to use the deuterated material in Australia, either at the neutron facility or other Australian research infrastructure, um, in order to get the material for free, basically. So this involves review, uh, reviewing the proposal by external referees. Uh, there is a uh, proposal advisory committee that uh, ranks the proposals and then there will be approval uh, by the NDF. There will be free, um, free of charge uh, with the exception of uh, recovering the cost for isotopic material used for multiple labeling of NMR, uh, or when we recover some uh, cost for shipping, uh, or when the material requested is in significant amount, which uh, put a lot of um, expenses on us, we ask to recover. But in general, it's actually for free. And the majority of our proposal come through this uh, access mode. The molecules or the proposals um, uh, requested in March will be delivered between July and December of the same year. And uh, proposals in September will be delivered in January uh, to July the year after. Uh, the other type is user pays uh, or collaboration. This uh, requires also requires a proposal, but that can be put anytime uh, through the portal. Uh, the molecules can be used anywhere in Australia or overseas. Um, that usually internally reviewed and, um, and then this inc incur a cost of 50%, uh, cost recovery for materials and labor. And we can deliver um, based on, by negotiation. So we, we negotiate on the time frame. And the other, the third type of access is the commercial. There's no proposal uh, needed here. Uh, uh, this this incur full cost recovery of labor and material, uh, and margin uh, on the on the costs. Um, as I said, uh, it's only internally reviewed or or approved by NDF leader. So we provide deuterated materials for uh, a variety of different um, applications. Uh, the majority will comes from neutrons. The one here on the left um, shows um, a molecule. Uh, that is used as a contrast matching, as a detergent used in um, uh, for neutron for sands um, by Lee's Arleth group uh, and others, um, where you can make this uh, detergent invisible in D2O and you can study the structure of uh, membrane proteins. We also provide deuterated materials uh, to uh, NMR community, to mass spec, infrared, and lately we've been providing uh, deuterated material for their own interesting properties um, as enhanced um, properties uh, as a result of the isotopic labeling. So it's, it's in the field of kinetic effect um, of the isotope kinetic effect of, of labeled uh, molecules. Uh, of course, today I'll be only focusing on the neutrons. So I won't be able to talk about the other ones. 
the capabilities from the NDF, uh, we've got uh, the biodeteration the, uh, that uses the bacteria and yeast to produce biomolecules. We have biopolymer um, uh, polyesters, um, uh, partial and pair deuterated uh, proteins. Uh, we deuterate DNA, um, multiple labeled proteins for NMR, cellulose and starch, chitosan, selectively labeled proteins, um, pair deuterated uh, or fully deuterated cholesterol. Recently, we've been deuterating this on 100 uh, plus milligram or 100 milligram plus um, of uh, deuterated uh, cholesterol from yeast. Uh, also, other sterols like campesterols, uh, PUFAs, uh, poly um, uh, unsaturated fatty acids, and squalene. Also, we've been uh, making them from deuterated yeasts. Um, in the chemical means, we've uh, been deuterating a variety of different molecules. This is only a small list there. Um, mainly, uh, you know, I'm listing here saturated and unsaturated uh, fatty acid. Um, Oleic acid is the is the most famous one, uh, and it's uh, lipids and phospholipids, uh, aromatics, uh, sugars, detergents, uh, tail deuterated cholesterol, which we can do it chemically, so that will only deuterate in the tail of the cholesterol. Uh, deuterated drugs, uh, ionic liquids, and mineral oils. On our website, you can check. Um, we have uh, updated our um, catalog. We took uh, advantage of um, the lockdown here. In, um, in Australia and Sydney a couple of months ago, and we worked on updating because of COVID, of course, and we worked and, and updated our catalog. We have more than 200 compounds listed on that catalog with their uh, structure and also the papers that they appear um, as they published um, afterward. So you can check this out. Um, the different deuteration facilities around the world here, th there are various neutron um, facilities around the world. These are the, uh, the major ones shown in yellow balloons, but only few uh, who carry out deuteration there. Uh, the National Deuteration Facility um, at ANSTO and the DMAX um, at uh, ESS are the only locations that, are, that basically carry both chemical and biological deuteration. Uh, we, got, we have the, from the top ESS, DMAX and LP3, uh, they have the chemical deuteration, biodeuteration, ISIS, chemical deuteration, ILL, DLAP and the Partnership for uh, Structural Biology. They do biodeuteration and, and the crystal, uh, crystallization. Uh, Ulich Center of Neutron Scattering uh, or Science, uh, poly, uh, polymer deuteration, um, and also uh, the uh, BL2 and Oak Ridge, the biodeuteration. And recently, uh, JPARC uh, and, Oak, uh, and Cross um, uh, they've been interested in building this capability, biodeuteration and chemical uh, deuteration, and also a new interest coming from China, uh, SLDF, we'll all talk about in a minute. Uh, they're interested in building biodeuteration facility. So the intention here in the next few slides is that I'm going to give you a summary of the different facilities, deuteration facilities around the world. Um, um, Sorry for being wordy here, uh, but the idea here is to have a summary of these facilities, their types, their specialties, and how you can access them. Um, so I'll start with ESS, DMAX, and LP3. Um, they offer chemical deuteration, biodeuteration, and crystallization. Um, that's at LP, uh, the LP3. They have uh, balanced uh, demand from the different uh, demand from the different capabilities. Um, Speciality, uh, they do lactic acid, detergents, um, oleic acid uh, recently. Uh, POPC and POPE, uh, they have um, um, published a nice way of making uh, POPC uh, by enzyme uh, or enzymatic reactions, uh, combining enzymes and um, organic synthesis. Uh, lipids from yeast um, um, and recombinant soluble proteins and from, uh, from E. coli and other material from uh, algae. And they also optimization of crystallization, HD exchange and protein uh, of protein crystals. From the LP3, they do the biodeuteration also in LP3. They do the triple labeling of NMR and purification. The way you access them, uh, DMAX runs uh, one call uh, for minute proposal uh, per year. Um, it's a free for users at the moment. There's no preference local or international. 
LP3, uh, you can submit proposal anytime uh, for anyone, um, but the, uh, there is a user fee uh, that applies there. Uh, BL2, which is the uh, Biomolecular Labeling Lab um, associated with NIST, they do bioreturation, uh, mainly protein expressed in E. coli and uh, some work with yeast. Their specialty, uh, basically, they have it on uh, triple labeling or, uh, for NMR applications, uh, as well as deuteration for SANS, uh, protein and nucleic acid um, and amino acid specific labeling of proteins uh, expressed in bacteria and yeast. Um, the majority of their access is through collaboration. Uh, if there is no collaboration, you need to put uh, a short application. The um, other facility is, uh, let me see here, did I miss anyone? No, um, Ulich uh, Center for Neutron Science, JECNS. Uh, mainly, uh, they do polymer deterioration, uh, organic molecules, and with focus on polymerization. Uh, um, anionic uh, and um, deuterated polymers via anionic and controlled radical techniques, uh, home on uh, block copolymers, uh, polystyrene, polydienes, and polyethylene oxide, uh, and other uh, polymers uh, with narrow molecular weight distribution. Um, so if you have um, need for deuterated polymers, um, is the is the, is the is the place to go. Access, um, they've been doing this in the past um, internally. However, uh, as I was told that uh, from next year, they will start to support the MLZ users uh, through merit proposal, which is yet to be um, uh, defined and, um, and set up. Um, ISIS is uh, the ISIS deterioration facility. They've been long in the, in the long time in the business, I guess since uh, Bob Thomas in Oxford and then move to ISIS. Uh, they do chemical deuteration, organic molecules, lipids, surfactants, and other uh, molecules. Um, you, um, to access them, you request deuterated molecules through the ISIS uh, proposal system uh, when applying beam time at ISIS. Um, ILL, D-Lab, and the PSB, uh, Partnership for Structure Biology, also, they've been a um, long time in the deuteration, the biodeuteration business. They do biodeuteration of microbes and extraction of lipids uh, by HPLC. So they do uh, uh, macromolecular and large crystal growth pair specific and match out deuterated um, proteins, nucleic acid and lipids, and uh, nanodisks, peptides, and, and uh, other molecules like uh, uh, cholesterol and fucose, as we heard yesterday from Anna, from Anne, sorry. And uh, this is a uh, joint between C and then you, you can have also access to joint SANS and cryo EM studies. Access is through rapid peer review as PSB uh, user platform uh, within the uh, ILL life sciences group. Uh, and this is through collaboration uh, through the ILL scientists. Um, and for uh, scientists using uh, NMR facilities uh, that are part of the ILL member state countries. Uh, J Park and Cross, as I said, they have interests. Um, they've been doing some biodeuteration uh, through collaboration. They started doing some chemical deuteration through power reactor work. Uh, this is still in biodeuteration uh, mode. Uh, Song uh, Chan La Lake uh, Materials Laboratory deuteration facility. This is a new interest coming from China. Uh, they're interested in developing biodeuteration capability, uh, microbial culture, processing, and characterization capabilities there. Access, at, uh, they, they eventually will have, um, doing it at the moment for col through collaboration and exchange. Uh, Oak Ridge Biodeuteration La Laboratory, uh, they've been doing biodeuteration of protein uh, and protein expression. And also, apparently, there um, uh, this is done through uh, support the SAN, uh, SNS uh, neutron applications. Um, so uh, that's what it says on their website. The challenges that we have uh, so far is uh, really around uh, infrastructure uh, is good, but we have limited staffing. Uh, we have highly uh, specialized skills, um, but we have a single point failure because of the uh, high specific or highly specialized uh, um, uh, skills needed. 
uh, we have high expense of raw materials uh, unless we order a bulk material. And so the co co uh, localization of labs, uh, chemical deterioration, biodeterioration together will help or like biodeterioration and crystal, uh, crystallization will help also uh, to minimize the cost. We have large diversity of requests uh, that also will put uh, pressure on capacity, um, large scale production, lag time in publication and also the effort versus the impact. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you the uh, deterioration facility, uh, the um, NDF, um, the National Deterioration Facility, um, the, the, the sequence of uh, how we have actually um, spread um, and have uh, international um, users coming in the last four years. Uh, we've grown our international users from 21% to 53%. The majority are coming from neutrons and the majority coming from mer uh, the merit excess and, and the merit uh, user and the user pays and a little bit through the commercial access. Um, I'm here uh, just uh, talking about the number of molecules we produce a year between uh, 40 to 60 and we receive about uh, 60 to 70 uh, proposals a year. Uh, we publish um, around 15 to 20 papers uh, a simple calculation means that we can produce uh, a paper for every three molecules uh, deuterated, which is which is good. The lag of time is, is a problem, but uh, three to one is a good uh, one. The I'm not going to talk about here. Uh, just the last couple of slides. I'm not going to take much time, uh, Michael. Here, I just want to show the uh, what's important is to focus on areas where you can deliver large quantities of material. Um, uh, that will give you the highest impact. So oleic acid, we've been deuterating this uh, and producing it for our uh, users on really large scale, uh, about 10 gram scale. We can do it three times in a very short period of time because we, can, we have scaled up and optimized uh, the reactions. It's about nine steps to make. And because of this, we can produce a variety of different labeled molecules and lipids. Um, DOPE to POPC, triolines, um, D, uh, GMOs. And because of this diversity of, of deuterated molecules and the scale of the deuterated molecules that we can produce, we are able to produce really high and, and um, impact science with our users. This is uh, an example of uh, deuterating the, uh, uh, the bicontinuous uh, cubic phases made of GMO uh, this is a work done with Leonie, Leonie Van Tag. Now she's in, in Monash. Um, by uh, deuterating uh, these pockets of um, nanostructures, you will be able to study the structure of proteins and their crystallization in these pockets. The other type of, of um, and, and because of the large quantities of oleic acid we produce, we can make uh, large quantities of nanodisc uh, nano lipids like the ones that here that we use with uh, Liz Arleth uh, from uh, Copenhagen University. This is an invisible lipid uh, for nanodisc studies, which has uh, 600 times less signal than uh, in 100% 100, 100 D2O than the commercial uh, deuterated lipid that you can find. The large scale deuteration of um, mineral oils um, uh, that we've been doing with our uh, industry uh, collaborator, Mitsui Chemicals from Japan. We've been able to produce large quantities of uh, deuterated mineral oils that help them in studying in situ sands polymer synthesis um, by using the deuterated mineral oils, which are required in large scale. The uh, the OLED, I've mentioned that in the uh, in the first slide, uh, using reflectometry, uh, we've been deuterating um, lots of molecules for uh, Paul Byrne and Ian Gentle, the group from UQ. Uh, this this slide only shows that what I want to take from this slide is that this is a, a hot area where you are focusing and 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 uh, putting effort in making a lot of molecules will produce a lot of paper. Fourteen molecules produce ten papers, so it's almost linear. Uh, another field is MOFs, um, which is the um, metal organic framework and diffraction studies where they can be used for uh, carbon capture, 
uh, hydrogen storage and um, studying the dynamics of these pockets. Um, three papers, uh, three, uh, three molecules have produced really uh, nice three papers with highly cited ones, and uh, also ionic liquids, uh, which have uh, been deuterated at large scale in collaboration with uh, Cross and JPARC. Uh, and we were able to deuterate uh, the, the tail and the head at different uh, level of deuteration in order to allow studying uh, by neutron reflectometry, the electric double layer and how the ionic liquid is uh, um, are assembling on, on the interface. Uh, with this, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the group, uh, the whole team um, at the NDF for uh, producing all these uh, deuterated molecules and interacting with the users. And I'd like to thank you for listening and um, I'm happy to take any question. Uh, thank you, Tamim. Um, slightly overrun, but uh, I think it's not too bad. Um, so, do we have any questions? I can't actually see any question at the moment. Um, maybe I would, one thing I could just um, maybe uh, mention to you, and, and um, in terms of deuterium, there's, there's, an, there's actually also quite a lot of interest now in, in, in the kind of structural materials research field uh, in using deuterium, because um, as you will probably be aware that, you know, in terms of doing this transition from, um, uh, from where we are now, uh, burning fossil fuel to a, you know, uh, to a society where we reduce CO2 emission, it's not just the, the, you know, the batteries, which we see as one way, but also uh, moving towards a more hydrogen economy. And I, I'm aware that Australia is particularly also looking at this now. Um, and, uh, and hydrogen in, in structural materials is a real issue and studying mm. those particularly. So there's, there, there, I think there will, there, well, there is already some research, but there will be probably more research in the future in, in looking at that, that. And hydrogen, so in some cases, or people are starting to look at using deuterium to charge metals with deuterium to actually study then the, you know, where it goes and where, you know, where the deuterium goes into the metal and, and its effect on the, on the performance. So the, maybe that's something one could uh, you know, consider also in the future. It's very different, of course, from what you've talked about. Um, yes, but... I've, I've actually seen um, a recent paper um, uh, where they use deuterated metals uh, to induce uh, fusion, nuclear fusion. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, yeah. So deuterated metals, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Yeah. It's quite different yeah. than what we do, but yeah, it's very, very deuterium different. in itself, it's a, it's a quite interesting molecule. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the, even making um, deuterated drugs, which is another, um, you know, uh, field uh, strengthening the bonds by removing hydrogen, putting deuterium, uh, making um, drugs more uh, effective in the body and live longer in the body. This is another, another um, deuteration uh, field. Yeah. Emerging. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we actually now have a few questions. It always takes a bit of time. Um, so we have uh, Zoe Fisher, who's actually asking two questions here. The first one is how many people in your team work only on bio deterioration? And uh, her second question is what percentage of your operating, operating costs are you recovering by charging back to users um, from, from non merit based requests? Okay, interesting uh, question, Zoe. Um, uh, the the second one is interesting. The first one, I think, uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, half half uh, five five people biodeuteration, uh, five staff biodeuteration, five um, chemical deuteration, roughly. Um, uh, we're trying to actually in the last year or so, we're trying to make this distinction. Uh, we're trying to actually merge the two groups together because. There's the biochemistry, which is in the middle, um, which is really can help the biologists and the chemists to bring new products. So I, I really don't like to answer this um, question anymore, but roughly 50-50, but really the biochemistry and the yeast, the enzymes that they can be um, uh, implemented to, to produce deuterated biomolecules is, is tremendous. So, um, 
they uh, we produced cholesterol, for instance, uh, sterols and and uh, poly uh, unsaturated fatty acid by biochemical means. So this is this is uh, it's kind of, uh, really interesting. So um, half half if you want, but uh, we're trying to make them all one NDF uh, chemical deuteration and biochemical biochemical uh, deuteration means. Uh, the second question is about the uh, recovering the cost. We're trying to recover the material costs um, um, when we use triple labeling of NMR, uh, for NMR, but for neutrons, um, the, it's for free for internet, for, um, for uh, researchers using uh, Australia's um, research infrastructure and, and, and uh, ACNS or the neutrons at ANSTO. So the deuterated material for free, but if they wish to use the deuterated material outside, then we're charging, in theory, we are actually charging them 50% cost recovery of labor and, uh, and the material involved. Um, I'm not sure if I answered you. If, if you need dollar, um, dollar figure values, then I can actually find out exactly and I'll let you know. Okay, I think that's, that's good enough. And, and, and I think Zoe can get into touch with you. If sure. More detail required because I just want to, there are two more questions, which yeah. um, so there's Hannah Wecklenknecht. Um, hi, Tamim. Uh, the capacity and achievements of the NDF are truly impressive. Can you comment on the ratio of staff to proposals that you can support? Um, that's also an interesting question. Um, uh, uh, very briefly, because of, of time, the, uh, we calculate the capacity um, of uh, our staff at each round, um, and we accept about uh, f about 40 proposal a year, roughly about 20 proposal every six months. Um, of course, the 10 NDF chemists, biochemists, biologists, uh, not all of them will produce or be working on producing the chemicals, but I would say about 50% of them will be uh, producing um, those chemicals and, and biomolecules. The others will be running the facility. Um, so it's a, it's a bit technical, which um, question, but, but this is a quick answer. Okay, thank, thank you. And the last question uh, from, from Neto, um, from your survey and request, you, you receive, so you receive, is the, it, oh, sorry, from the survey and request you receive, is there an area that we are clearly failing to su support either in chemistry or bio biology? Should facilities be more proactive supporting deuteration? Excellent question. Um, it's uh, certainly we have seen, I mean, um, increase in, uh, when you have a deuterated material, um, there is a, a increase in the impact uh, of the of the of the uh, of the research that's done, uh, that's obvious um, from the impact factor of the papers that we we've been um, seeing from the deuterated materials we're supplying or the deuterated material that other facilities um, are supplying. Uh, the area um, that is required, I think, it's in the scale up. That this is this is the thing you need to scale things. Uh, to a level where you can become cost effective for you, where you can supply different, uh, the same material for different uses. So I've talked about the lipids and the oleic acid and, and making large quantities of these lipids um, in, in one round, you can actually sit, uh, you know, sit, do nothing for the next two rounds if you make gram quantities of them, because this is where the, 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 the highest demand is, uh, is coming from. Uh, what we where we're failing or where we need uh, work is in polymer. I think polymer deuterate, deuterated polymers is is a quite um, uh, lacking. So I'm 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 glad to see uh, J um, J um, Ulich, uh, JNCS is, uh, is is putting effort there. Okay, thank you. Um, it's actually just come a quick one. Another question, which is quick. I mean, we're running a bit late now. Have you considered approaches for, sorry, this is Trevor Fawcett. Uh, have you considered approaches for the production of 
appropriately glucotetsalized proteins using insect and mammalian cells. Hi, Trevor. Uh, I think I, I know what you mean. Um, um, no, we haven't used insects or mammalian um, uh, cells. Um, and I think the, the name of the molecule is glucosides, I think. Um, yeah, that's right. That, oh, yeah. yeah, glucosides. Probably. No, we haven't used glucosides um, oh, or this okay. type of, uh, of material. Hang on, uh, let me let me get the let me get him. Up. It's uh, uh, he can uh, yeah. Uh, hang on. Should be able to allow to talk. Trevor, you, you you can speak now. Oh, hello. Hi, yeah. Trevor. Hello, no, okay, my question was about glycosylated proteins, which is something that with this uh, it, huge interest in viral systems, uh, we're all producing various proteins that are in coli and other places where if you want them deuterated, you're going to have to go to some sort of expression system where you can produce them in glyc glycosylated form. That usually means insect cells or mammalian cells. And the question I have is, I mean, we, we're, we're thinking, we're, we're working along the lines of developing this, but. Well, I just wondered whether you thought about it as well, because the interest that's come out of the crisis has obviously stimulated a lot of um, proposals coming in for these things. Yes, yes, certainly, uh, Trevor. It was glycosylation. Um, it wasn't about glucose or glycosides or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I now I understand it. Um, yeah, we we started to get uh, these requests from users um, for um, for this type of uh, deuterated. Um, uh, Proteins. Because if you if you look at things like the spike protein, they're, they're not yep. really going to be uh, relevant in what you can deduce from them if you don't get the glycosylation right. The folding and all of these things uh, do depend on that. And uh, so uh, at the moment, it's it's a limitation. And I agree completely about this issue of staffing because it, it determines uh, everything that you can actually offer to the community. The user community uh, is determined by... Um, appreciating the fact that if you want to get the most out of your neutron experiment, you've got to make the best effort for the samples. Yeah, there is uh, a lot of research involved in, in what we do, and it's not yeah. only the infrastructure. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, 100%. it's people. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks for um, all the discussion, um, which has been really great to see. Uh, so we've overrun slightly, but, you know, um, important is that we, we spend time discussing things. Um, I don't know if anybody now who's um, from the ILL or ESS who is on the panel wants to uh, say a few words before we close the session. Mark? Uh, no. <laughs> I think, yeah, okay. Michael, you, you've done a great job chairing. So thank you very much. It's been another fascinating session, a very good range of talks, uh, and I appreciate those of you in the Southern Hemisphere for staying up so late to, uh, to be with us today. And uh, so thank you all. Michael, you, you closed the session. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for, for you know, attending and, and staying with us. Uh, thanks for the four speakers. Excellent, you know, you, you've seen the, the broad range uh, of research that is carried out uh, at neutron facilities. And you've also seen actually a lot of links to other other equipment, other, other other facilities, and other equipment that is used, and and you know the importance of using uh, com complementary techniques, and and that neutron a neutron facility, you know, uh, shouldn't just be seen standing on itself by itself, but actually it's part of a large characterization suite. And what we've also seen a lot, I think, is the you know the importance of moving towards in situ, and here of course facility uh, a neutron scattering facility uh, you know has, has has you know has great potential and of course is is leading the way in many ways uh going from from ex seed to post-mortem to to in situ in operando studies so thank you everybody and thanks again all the speakers for the for the great talks and thanks the audience for engaging so much and i'm closing the session now and i'm having a beer thank you very much okay Thank you. See everybody about uh, for the afternoon session. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.